Um, <laughs> welcome to Intro to Strategic Planning, everyone. Uh, we've called this session Crafting the Future of Your Nonprofit, and we are just so grateful that you all took the time out of your busy days to think uh, big picture with us. My name is Liz Tang. I use the pronoun she, her, and I'm the program coordinator for Integral Org, um, and I'll be around hosting and monitoring the chat and doing any sort of tech support you might need. Um, without further ado, we'll hop right into our land acknowledgement. Mm -mm. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that Integra Org is based out of, based out of Mokinstis, which is the Blackfoot name for Elbow. And this refers to the confluence of Elbow and Bow Rivers that run through the Treaty 7 territory. Mokinstis is the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Siksika, the Bagani, and Kainai, as well as the Stony Nakoda First Nations, consisting of the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Good Stony First Nations. And Mokinsis is also home to the Sutina First Nation and finally the Metis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. At Integra Org, we do recognize that there's this existing tension between the legal and governance structures that we work within and efforts towards truth and reconciliation. And so we do accept our responsibility to work towards reconciling this tension. And we all, settlers and Indigenous included, have a connection and responsibility to the lands that host our lives, our communities, and our work. And just to introduce ourselves a little bit, um, Integra Org is a capacity builder and a nonprofit ourselves, and so our goal is to equip you with the knowledge and support that you can, uh, so that you can best do the work that you do. We work in many core areas, um, of course, strategic planning, like uh, we're looking at today, but with our expertise in board development and legal support, and now leadership training, just to name a few, we like to work with organizations at any point in their life cycle with an approach that integrates the many aspects of a thriving nonprofit. Yeah, very happy to introduce today's facilitator. This is Mike Grogan. He's the president and CEO of Integra Org, and he has over 30 years of experience creating impactful and lasting solutions that fit the changing needs of a variety of nonprofit and charitable organizations. So thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great uh, session. Thank you, Liz. I'm a little disappointed that I'm not your favorite voice, and it's actually the Zoom recording voice is kind of devastated by that, but I'll try to weather through this and present stuff anyway. So uh, thanks, folks. Thanks for joining us. It's always, I always love doing these kind of sessions and to gather the folks and and uh, to sort of talk through different parts of our work today on strategic planning, which we'll try to demystify for you, give you ways to sort of get into it and yeah, probably a different number of ways. So now if you're big, small, just starting out, I mean, everybody sort of has to think through some of these things, but it's not necessarily overwhelming. So um, great to spend some time with you today. Uh, if there's questions, please do pop in the chat. We'll have some time at the end. We usually don't quite go the full hour. Um, whatever question you have, then throw it in the title. I mean, if you've got the question, likely somebody else does as well. And really, this isn't about us presenting stuff. This is about you learning what you need to learn and whatever that might be. If you don't want to answer it here, by all means, do reach out afterwards. And we're always up for conversations. This is what we do. We come alongside organizations. We teach, we coach, we walk alongside you and help where we can. So thanks for being here and looking forward to talking about all things strategic day with a number of interactive bits. Never quite heard it described that way. Thank you, Liz. Um, and just something I'll, I'll use a lot of quotes for my well, a few in this one, but if you hang around with me long enough, you'll see a lot of quotes. Uh, this one is what we do today that creates tomorrow. And I think there's a probably sometimes a sense in the nonprofit world that, you know, we're not masters of our own domain. We don't get the sense we can actually control where we're going to go. And, and to some degree, that's true. I mean, we are, you know, you sometimes money or people or programs or whatever it might be. They're tough to say we can actually direct that kind of stuff. But uh, there are things we can do. There are things we can do to say the steps we need to take can create some version of tomorrow. And that's what we want to talk about when strategic planning is. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about, we're going to talk today about the components of strategic planning. We're going to break them down into some really clear buckets, I think. Whether they all fit for you or not, that's entirely up to you. Um, pick and choose as you like. You may have already done some of these things. You likely already have. Um, well, you probably have more of these things in place than you know already. So take advantage of those. If there's other pieces to put in place, by all means, listen to those parts too. 
Uh, we'll try to use some of the tools and processes. It's not just theory. We want to make sure that you're, you're, what you're doing to understand who you are, what your organization's like, what capacities you have, and then what's happening beyond your organization. A lot of times we sort of think strategy is just what we want to do. But again, a lot of what happens to us happens beyond the walls of our organizations. So we need to understand those pieces. We'll get to playing with those kind of stuff a little bit here in one of those said interactive bits. And then how to keep this front and center. You know, if there's one thing where strategy fails at, at, at any organization, big, small, private, public, doesn't matter. Um, you know, you can write a strat plan that can sit in the shelf for weeks and months and years. And then a few years later, you go back to it. And how do you keep things in front of you? And how do you say this really is a strategy, not just a process you went through and it helped you for a bit or satisfied some funder need, perhaps, or satisfied your board? I mean, what do you do to really keep this as a living, breathing, guiding document without being too rigid? Because none of us are smart enough to think two, three, five years out. Um, we can put some pieces in place and set ourselves directionally and then give ourselves a way to adapt and move as we sort of progress through whatever life has to has in store for us. So just like some starting pieces here. You know, it's hard to make choices. If you're sort of thinking, you know, there are things that kind of lock us in as charities and nonprofits. You know, we've got objects. If you're a charity, you've got charitable purposes and you need to be aligned with those charitable purposes. But you got a lot of choices to how to sort of enact those, how to get there. How do you get from where you are today or where you want to go? And there's not a lot of certainty sometimes. Like we've come through a few years where there's tons of uncertainty. And when you plan in uncertainty, that's really, really hard. And one of the rules of thumb we have in, in strategy planning is as uncertainty grows, the length of your planning needs to shrink. So, you know, in those first year of COVID, we were probably doing strat plans that were you know, six months, maybe a year long. That's about as far as anybody can envision. And even that was pretty flawed sometimes. Now you kind of think three years isn't bad, but still in the next three years, who knows what might happen? Think back three years ago today to whatever that be, November 16th, probably uh, 2020. You're still in that first, really first wave of COVID that first time with a whole bunch more to come. So if you think through you know, hindsight, we don't really know what's going to happen, but you can make some choices. You don't need to be paralyzed. The idea of when choices be made, you do need to make choices. And sometimes we sometimes we freeze and say we don't need to make choices. And, and when things are going well, you can probably do that. If things get a little tough, that paralysis can be a little more challenging for you. So there are ways to do that. You know, we've come through, I think, recovery somewhat from the economic downturn, from the social disruption, from all things in the pandemic, but the impacts are still here. So we're not done yet. And uh, it may feel like we're done. Uh, maybe some days it doesn't feel like we're done as you hit the fall again. But, you know, that some of the things we're seeing now in organizations were stuff I would have thought I'd see a year ago. Organizations who were struggling, maybe they're a little weak before COVID, but kind of got propped up or helped along with some support money. That's really all gone now, been gone for over a year, perhaps. But it takes a while for those to work their way through the system. So even though I think the economy is doing well and labor markets are kind of booming again and all those kind of good things, there are a lot of pressures out there. We have inflation. You've got um, some of the lagging impacts. One of the things that happens in nonprofits quite often is we lag the overall economy. So as the overall economy goes down into a recession, sometimes nonprofits will take a year, perhaps six months to a year to sort of feel that. As we come out again, and then that lag is still there. So even though the overall economy is coming out, we're probably still lagging a bit of that in the nonprofit world. So to recognize that, that just because it looks like things are good out there in the rest of the world, it may not be the case. Or it may be for your organization. There's a lot of nonprofits in this province. I won't tell you how many because I'm going to ask you in a few minutes. But the idea of, you know, what your particular circumstances are, don't work in a vacuum. You've got to be aware of what's happening around you. And the biggest piece in strategy, and if I can leave you with anything today, well, not this, because I've got a whole bunch more to say, but I'll come back to this one. The idea that saying no is um, a really important part of strategy. There's a lot of times, and we're certainly guilty of it, times doing this, where you, you leave yourself open to opportunities and saying, well, we'll see what happens with funding. We'll see what happens in a different realm of work. Maybe some opportunities open up. And that can be okay. That's fine. But you tend to wander a bit. And so the discipline of saying no, what fits in your lane? What fits in your mandate? What is really strategic? not just beneficial or um, sort of expedient. So how to say no is one of the bigger parts of, of strategy. We'll sort of give you a graphic to, to narrow down some options that way. So why do we need a strategy? You know, why, why would anybody need a strategy? We talk about it a lot, but you can get by without a strategy and be honest about this. You can be successful for years without strategy. I know organizations who sort of have a very light strategy and um, 
can continue on that way. And so you don't necessarily need one. I wouldn't recommend it because I think, again, when things get tough, you've got nothing to measure yourself by to sort of say, is this something we should or shouldn't do? Hard to sort of set direction, hard to say yes or no, hard to measure you know, your impact and where you've come from, where you're going without it. So it's a piece of the puzzle. It doesn't drive everything. But one of the reasons we do these things, you know, just to recognize it, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to do this. So the idea of crafting a strategy you don't need to use a particular process. It can be overwhelming sometimes. We'll ask in a second here whether you have a strat plan or not and how meaningful it might be. But you know, don't worry about, I'll give you some concepts here. You can Google concepts, you can hire consultants, you can do all kinds of stuff. Find something that fits your size and style of organization. Okay. So, you know, there's lots of ways to do this. And it really is going to depend on a number of pieces. You are unique. There's a lot of nonprofits out there, but we're not all quite the same. So, the organizational size, if you're a three or four person nonprofit, small board, maybe a working board, maybe no staff, it's a little bit different than if you're a giant nonprofit with 500 staff and then tens of million dollar budget. The level of strategy, the type of strategy, the process you need to go through perhaps to craft a strategy to be different on that kind of things. The number and types of programs. If you have one thing you do, well, the strategy is maybe a little more straightforward. Not that it isn't easy. It's not necessarily easy to figure what how to make that go, but it's not like you're running 10 or six, 10 or 12 programs where you got to figure out how they all fit together as part of a mix and that kind of thing. Uh, funding and, and types of funding and structures, levels, that kind of thing. If you're a government funded agency and you've had a government contract to deliver some sort of perhaps social service or mental health or educational product or service, and you've had that product for 20 years, and that's really what drives your work. Well, strategy lane is probably a bit narrow. I mean, your, your, your choices that you can make in that sense don't necessarily, can't wander outside the funder's expectations. So it's one of the nuances of strategic planning for the nonprofit sector. There's a lot of places where we're not quite sure we, can, we may want to go, but you got to go find the funding to do it, or if you maybe there's no funding there. So there are some limitations, and funding probably is one of the bigger ones, I would think, in this case. I would also say that human resources are probably going to rival that quite soon, that, that the human resource challenges we're starting to see in the sector are really growing. So can we get people at the governance level, volunteers, staffing, executive level? I think all those are really being challenged right now. So part of strategy is how do you care for and, and build out your workforce, probably for any organization. Uh, the types of stakeholders that you engage. I mean, if you're working with people where you have a strong voice of clients in the way you do things, then that's probably a place to bring in people to strategy. If your board is really super engaged or you're working only as a board, then that's another type of strategy. Sometimes people like to bring in like funders or community members to the planning process. That can and cannot work sometimes. Funders tend to be a little limited in what they bring to it because they're there as a funder. They're not necessarily there for you. And then the external operating environment, as I've talked about it in the past, you know, if we're headed into a boom time, then strategy maybe has a little, you know, a little more room to sort of do some things. Maybe we can try and stretch ourselves a bit. If we're thinking we're heading to a few years of downturn and recession, then my strategy probably needs to be aware of that and not just sort of think I can do what I want outside of that vacuum. So again, uncertainty, uh, just some thoughts. Uncertainty sort of shortens our length. I think right now we're in a pretty stable time. I don't, you know, there's going to be some ups and downs and this sort of maybe perhaps this indication of a recession coming, whether that comes or not, we'll see. But this is not like the uncertainty of the last few years. We're starting to see a little more gra solid ground under our feet here. And that probably allows us to take some probably bigger steps, maybe a few more steps along the way. Um, when we're talking about strategy, you know, and the implementation of it, we like it to be inclusive. So you're you're working with a number of people. I can sit at my table or my desk here and write a strategy for the organization and people will say, that's great. You're the CEO, Mike, off you go. But it's not, they're not going to own it. Like it's not going to be something we co-created together. And when you do it in isolation, you segment this out to a small group or the board or a working group, um, that's a tougher one to do because then you got to sell it to everybody else and they haven't seen their voice in it. I think as a kind of a standard rule of thumb, people who help create something have a lot more ownership. And if you have more ownership, I think building it out is a far better way of doing it. Uh, acting out is a far better way if you do it inclusively. Being sure it's clear and focused, again, that not just everything's strategic, good ideas, there's a lot, good ideas are easy. We got lots of ideas, we're nonprofits, everybody has great ideas. You're here because somebody had a great idea. How to make that strategic is a different sort of piece altogether.
And then it, it sits across all organized parts of the organization as a strategy piece. It's in the governance side of things. It's in management and how we operate these things. And so it's not just a an executive function. It's not just the function of one department or one person. Everything to really work through your strategy needs to be aligned. And that's where does the board's role in strategy? Where does staff work on strategy? Um, that kind of stuff. So making sure that it's not just one part of your organization that is engaged in the planning process. At the end of the day, what you're trying to end up is this, and it, it is quite uh, simple in many ways, a strategic plan. And this is from a guy named David Lapian out of the States. And and, uh, and we don't use a lot of American materials sometimes in the jurisdictional stuff, but this one is conceptual. So I think it's not a bad one. It is that a strategic, strategic plan is a coordinated set of actions designed to create and sustain a competitive advantage in achieving our mission. Two really important pieces here, I think. One is that this is a coordinated set of actions. You can write four or five or six strategy, whatever you have, but they don't stand apart from each other. If you write a strategy line and some activities about money, that's not totally disconnected from the people side. What do I need to enact this? It's not disconnected from the program side so that they are coordinated, they're integrated, they fit together as a whole. They are not separate streams of strategy. Second piece is to create and sustain a competitive advantage in achieving our mission. Achieving your mission, that's the ultimate goal of every nonprofit. And a lot of times we write these mission statements that are quite broad and quite big and a lot of times not achievable. But that is the goal. We're trying to end hunger, to you know feed the poor, to create art, whatever it might be. There's all kinds of missions, tons of missions out there. The idea of creating and sustaining a competitive advantage. It's not the language we tend to use in nonprofits, but I really like it is you do not work, you don't work alone. Um, there's a lot of nonprofits, I'm gonna ask you to guess here in a few minutes how many there are. But the idea that, you know, that you're unique is probably not true. I wish I was a unique organization. There are other capacity building organizations in the city, in this province. And so I'm not here to act competitively, but I do need to say, how does this set me apart? Why would people choose my products, my services, my ways of support over someone else's? And that's what strategy does. It does have to direct you, but it also has to say, give you that sense of how this separates us from the pack a bit. There's lots of needs out there, lots of demands. There's lots of needs for many, many nonprofits. But the idea is it gets a little murky when there's a lot of us out there. So how do you set yourself apart and have that competitive advantage to make sure that your great idea, your strategic proposal, your mission is achieved? So I want to just, uh, we're going to say a little poll, I think right now, Liz. We're going to, I want to say, do does your organization have, currently have, a strategic plan that meaningfully guides your work? Anything we need to know about this, Liz? It pops up. What happens here? Um, no, I think it kind of popped up for everyone. I see some answers flowing in right now. Do you see the um? I see happening? interactive bits happening before my eyes. It's good. It's like to behold. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody else can see it. That's the thing. I have no idea what people can see because I'm working on a uh, monitor. No, well, I'll, sh I'll share it in a second um, once we get more than 55% answered here. Um, but we had our options. We use it often. Yes, we use it sometimes. We don't have a strategic plan or I don't know if we have a strategic plan. That's the best answer. I like that one a lot. <laughs> and this is completely it. anonymous. So if you, you no, could be not. honest. I know who said that one. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's six. And it is, you know, this. It, it, there is no right or wrong answer on this one. It, this is just to get a sense of where, where we are on the You got our shared list? Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm going to share it now. And yep. everyone should be able to see it now. Well, a bit of a range. A lot of people at fifty percent. We have one. We use it often. Fantastic. Why are you here? What are you doing? I mean, I'm here. Take the afternoon off. Um, no, there's always more to learn. Uh, we use it sometimes. We don't have a plan, and I don't know if we have a plan, which tells you something in that one too. Great range. No red. Right, no right or wrong answer. Um, this is something you, you got to come back to time after time. The strategy is not the process of creating one that can take you know months or perhaps longer sometimes that's not the important part you know i think there's a lot of value can come from that it's how you use it and so that idea that we use it often is really good that's how strategy should work so stop sharing this mm -hmm. and, oh there we go yeah, you'll just um, have to exit out there you go i just did that there we go um so the reason we have strategies, why do we have one? So, I mean, you use it often, great poll, fantastic, good to hear. Um, what it does, a few different things. These aren't uh, probably rocket science. It identifies and articulates your focus and priorities, um, both internally. So it tells us and tells me and the staff and the board where we're going. This is where we think we should go. We should develop out this funding stream. We should work on our human resources this way. These are the products we should, or the services we should put out there. This is perhaps our... Um, 
uh, internal capacity. I mean, we we tend to we write strategies, and we do quite a bit of strategic work on a, on a um, part of our consulting side of the, the work here. Is that we tend to put you know strategy into four or five really big buckets. You know, people, money, the profile of your organization. Um, your programs and services, and then something usually internal infrastructure. And you can sort of move those around. You don't necessarily need them all. They can be called different things. But in general, those are kind of the five pillars of a strat plan. You know, the people you serve, the programs you offer, the people who run them, the money it takes to do it, the profile, how people know who you are, and then what you need to do to keep the whole thing going, IT systems, that kind of good stuff. Um, it allows for us to uh, allocate resources and energy. So we have to make decisions. I'm doing budgets right now, and I'm sort of thinking, okay, how do I make some choices about where I want to sort of spend or not spend, or if I had money, spend more money um, to do that kind of stuff. So it allows me to make some choices saying, okay, strategically, we said we're going to invest in our staff. Okay, I probably need to put a little more energy or thought or perhaps money into that bucket than perhaps my program expansion. So it allows me to say I've got something that actually really does make concrete decisions and focus that energy. It ensures we're all sort of pulled in the same way. I mean, it's a, if you picture a big giant rowboat with a whole bunch of set of oars, and if, if you're not all pulling the same way, you're not going that fast, you're not going that far, or it's gonna take you a lot longer as you sort of zigzag and, and sort of wander through things. So that idea of how do we sort of focus ourselves and all make sure whoever we are, whatever role we have in the organization, that we're all kind of heading the same direction. And it gives us a sense. It may not articulate the exact outcomes. A lot of strat plans may not go that deep, but it starts to say, we're going to go from someplace to someplace. And I'll talk about that metaphor of moving from A to B, which is really what strategy is. But it, it agrees where we're heading. So if we say we're going to be financially resilient, we've got something to measure ourselves against. If it says, if our plan says we're going to double our programming, well, that's a bit of a metric. That's an outcome for us. We're going to double some programming. And uh, if we're right or wrong, it, it's that's not necessarily the point sometimes. I mean, um, it's the idea we set a stake in the ground and we're starting to say this would be success. And again, we don't always know what success looks like two, three, four years out. We know our best intentions and we build in ways to adapt and learn as we go. So there we go. Just the idea that as and as things change, we got to build in a frame to adjust. So sometimes we can be too locked into strategies saying, you know, I plan to really, you know, grow my organization by tenfold in the next five years. Fantastic. If that fits. And we've had organizations. We had an organization we worked with and they were working in a space where there's a big government funding piece that was going to basically be a five-fold increase in this organization's budget. For their strat plan, we started the process. They thought, we'll be, you know, we'll go from $3 million to $15 million in five years. And they rightfully so. That was sort of on the horizon. They had sort of the rough agreement in place. Government changed, philosophy of how you work with, in this case, mental health and addictions changed. And the government funding got pulled and that $3 million organization that thought they were going to $15 million is today a $3 million organization. So no worse off, but their ex the external environment changed. They had to adjust what they're going to do in their strategy. So the process. So, so how do we get there? The idea of that's what a plan is, that coordinated set. The process is just the process to determine where you're going, the actions needed to make progress and how you'll get there. So, you know, direction sort of the actions to get to that direction and that measure of success. Quite straightforward, quite simple, balanced scorecard, a nice little place to get some, some information from in terms of planning. Everything we put out here today in terms of slides or content, we'll always resource. I think there's some resources at the end. If there's something more that wasn't clear, please do reach out, but we'll, uh, we'll let you know where we get stuff from so you can go access it yourself. Okay, go to the next one. Don't move your mouse mic, there we go. So how do we develop a strategy? Okay. Yeah, again, it's not, it's not, it shouldn't be onerous. It should fit you. It should feel good. It should feel developing strategy should be exciting, energizing, coalescing piece. If it's done well, it's the, what you come out with is important. The how you come out, get to there is really important. And if you've gone through a strategy process and it just feels like a grind and you're more disconnected, there's some lack of clarity, you're not on the same page, you probably haven't gone through a good process. So the idea, this should be something that is energizing, it is, is exciting. Does you think, okay, we can do this kind of stuff. Again, lots of ways to do this, find something that fits your organization. I think using a defined process does add value. It doesn't have to be our process. Our processes change all the time, working with different organizations, but use a process. It is the idea that it, it applies a discipline to this. If I just sort of do what I want and say, let's have a few meetings, write down some things we think are strategy, it doesn't push us enough. It doesn't challenge us enough. 
It probably um, reinforces our own biases sometimes. So while using a process, whether that's an external facilitator with a set of planning resources, whether it's in a workshop type environment, something that gives you some way to do some thinking and challenge yourself to think about things that you probably haven't thought of in that way before. You may not put those in your plan by the end, but something that prompts you, something that makes you think beyond our own ways of thinking. We all fall into our own ways of thinking. I do it every day. So something that challenges me to do that in terms of some sort of process, tool, support, I think is really important. And just remember that the planning and the their, and plans, planning process and plans themselves, they're means to an end. These are help us to achieve our mission. How you achieve your mission is a whole bunch of different routes. So yes, planning and scrap plans are important, but they're means, not ends. We should never confuse the two. So what we do, um, when we talk about strap planning, it's really, there's a number of pieces we put in place for these things. And you can go through a whole bunch of gazillion books out there in strap planning. You don't have to sort of lock into one that's just nonprofit centric, but they all kind of fall into a few different ways. It's that cycle of preparing and visioning and planning and evaluation. So you have a number of things. You prepare yourself. You sort of think where we are today. You sort of dream about the future, the actual planning, and then how do you evaluate it? We like to understand the currency of the organization, where you are today. You know, we'll talk through each of these pieces. I'll give you some thoughts and tools on each of these chunks here. So it's not just some really quick stuff here. But where you are today, you know, we'll talk about the industry around you. Um, there's lots of nonprofits out there, but how many are kind of like you? The external environment and then what the desired future how to establish goals, actions, priorities, sort of taking it from really big down to step-by-step -step type things, and then how we'll put some timelines and evaluation there. Lots of processes, they're all gonna have some version of it, this in there, the language might change here and there. Again, find something that works for your organization. So when we talk about these things, clarifying your current state, you know, uh, strengths and development areas and everything, governance, manage, and operating systems. Every organization has strengths and weaknesses. Um, it, it, no matter who you are, I don't care if you're big, small, brand new, been around forever, there's things you really do well or things you do sort of well and things you don't do well at all. But to understand those are really important. We do some evaluation work before we work with organizations. When we work with organizations and strap planning, I'll show you our tool here in a second. And it, it just sort of helps sort of getting those sort of landmines out of the way. So knowing where you're starting from today is really important. Understand that external environment again, what's happening out there, trends, dynamics. You know, you may not understand them all, but good to think about them. We'll play with that in another interactive bit here in a little bit. The industry you work within, lots of organizations out there. How do you set yourself apart? Deciding the, the future elements where you want to be in three, like an asterisk there. You know, three years kind of see a nice strap planning lane right now. You see a lot of five. Some people had 10-year plans. I can't comprehend that. One's a bit short. I like three, but again, whatever fits you. Your environment may be really stable and you think, I can actually plan out three or five years. It doesn't mean you just have to stop thinking out further than that, but your plan itself might have some limits along the way. And then the idea of plans, or priorities, actions, roles, who's going to do what. Again, how do you make this not just be a static kind of on-the-shelf document that would kind of fund or write and you forgot about something happened? How do you keep this kind of in, in building your, giving you some real active direction again? I like to think about the planning process this way. This is what we call strategy funding funnel. And really, it sort of takes you through from the very broad end at the wide end of the funnel down to the pointy knob at the end there and say, okay, how do we work through this? And at that far end where it's broad, we're talking about awareness. You're trying to get a lot of ideas on the table. You're trying to say, okay, what are we doing well now? What's not happening? What should we do better? What are some possibilities out there? You're brainstorming stuff. You're saying, okay, we know we've worked a certain way for a long time, but what's different about ourselves now? What could we do different? The idea here is to generate a lot of different ideas, not kind of ideas that are, well, could be any idea. I'm not going to limit what it is. Um, and as you move through this, you have some conversations, you work through some processes, you, you sort of refine some things, you, these, you combine some of these ideas, you get some ideas of, in some insights. Okay, good ideas, down to insights. That's a big of a jump from the idea to insights, a big move sometimes, but it does work its way through to say, okay, I'm starting to see some threads here developing. So I'm pulling some things together and synthesizing things. We're starting to dream about the future. And as we work through that a bit further, we say, okay, we get an idea of where we're going. And now we're talking about strategy. At the end of the day, strategy is this. It's getting from A to B. A is where we're at today. B is where we want to go in the future. We may not have quite a full understanding where it's going to go, but pretty enough. We've got a good idea where we want to go. Strategy is getting from A to B. Lots of different routes. There's not one path there. Things might happen. We'll be sort of dragged down and take a bit of a different route for a while. But really, A, who we are today. B, where you're going to go in the future. And then the steps along the way, that's when we talk about actions and strategies, saying strategies, kind of the big steps, 
the actions are kind of those little ones that sort of feed into those bigger steps along the way. So it goes from broad to narrow, A to B, defining it down using a process. And this, when I talk about using a process, this is a sort of, uh, I think, a, an illustration of what a process may look like here, okay? Uh, what are we gonna talk about next? So knowing your past, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you just a couple minutes on each of these things. Everybody's are halfway through already. I'm only got through you know, six of my slides or something. Um, uh, knowing your capacity. I think this is probably one of the most important pieces here is to knowing where you're starting from, to develop that common understanding of your key operational governance, management, strategic capacity is the critical first step. Um, you know, I think doing this on a regular basis, it's like the checkup. Like it's like when you go to see a doctor, you go yearly sort of, um, the idea that you uh, you should sort of see who are we today and where are we strong, where are we weak? And there's lots of ways to do this. So we'll give you a couple tools here, but it does no good to start to say, we're going to start this planning process if your house is on fire. So we had organizations come to us and say, we got built us a plan for this new program we want to offer to an organization. You think, okay, great, let's do a quick little assessment with you. And you realize that yeah, you're, you're, you're almost bankrupt and uh, you, you kind of got no staff. So we probably should help you fix those things first before we put the second story in the house. So it's really important that you understand where you are and that it's a common understanding for the board, the staff to say, okay, we know where we're weak. We know where we're strong. There's no shame in any of that. We're all, we all have things we got to fix. But to be really clear, we know what we've got to work with before we start taking those maybe big or even minor sort of first steps. Again, doing it on an ongoing basis. A couple of ways you can do this. This is just a SWOT, a SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunity, threats, pretty standard planning kind of tool. And it just walks you through some questions. So we'll do this as a group, as a board. You know, what do you do really well? Where are your best? Those are kind of your strengths. You know, what hinders your performance? What do you want to improve? That's not a bad way too. You've kind of got the strengths and weaknesses. Opportunities and threats are kind of more external. So strengths and weaknesses internal, opportunities and threats external. What's out there? What are the opportunities we might want to, to adjust to, to advance right now? Always all kinds of stuff out there we could do. Doesn't mean you're going to do them all, but put them on the table. Get those brainstorming things out there. Conversely, what's the threat? What might really hinder your organization? What's coming up in the next little bit? We can't sort of guess these things sometimes. You can take a shot at those. And to say, okay, what's going to, what's going to hold us back in the years to come here? So that's a way of sort of doing this sort of check-in on where you are today. Another way of doing this is an organizational assessment. We do these as part of our planning processes. We're building, refining these a bit more as we go. And this is a tool we use with boards and staff to say, do, and we can customize it, probably 80 questions. It's, you know, just choose an answer, it doesn't take too long. But it gives you a way of doing it a little more anonymously. And that's why we like it. If you're sitting around the table and you're a staff member and you're doing a SWOT exercise we just did in the past, you know, it's unlikely a staff person to say, yeah, one of our weaknesses are a board. You know, they're really not pulling their weight. That's a tougher one to do sometimes. So there's each of these are going to have some some you know ways they work and ways they don't. So pick and choose again what works for you. And I guess other ways to do it too. Those are just two ways that we would perhaps do it. Know the industry you work within. We don't talk about the nonprofit sector. There's a sector. I'm an economist by background, so you have sectors which are sort of big nonprofit, public, private. Then you have industries like you know construction or in, in the nonprofit sector, mental health or education or arts or those kind of things. You can break it down a whole bunch of different ways. But we do work within industries more or less. So there's groupings of like size entities that we tend to work with. It may not even be nonprofits. If you're a childcare provider, you're gonna have private ones, public ones, nonprofit ones. You kind of got to know who's in your kind of your kind of zone there that you're sort of maybe competing with, maybe working with, maybe whatever it might be. So who's in your industry? I have a question for you, though. This is the big broad one as a sector. I want you to put this in the chat, I believe, right? Let's, let's, we're going to do this in the chat. So use the chat, the little button top, bottom, somewhere on your screen there. Uh, how many nonprofits are active within Alberta right now? Just type in a number for me. I'll actually look at the chat so I can actually see what you're gonna say. That's a good question. Um, but uh, put a number in the chat if you could. Just how many non oh, things you're starting to put up there. Fantastic. I see one that said 3,400. Good first start. Let's see where we go. 8,000, oh, we're going up to five. Oh, we're down to five. It's like a little, little barometer. It's going up and down. Come on, get that baby going. Over a thousand. Yeah, a little vague. Come on, nail it down. More than three. Yeah, got that. 2,500. All right. 26,000. 26,000. Nice. Yeah. Kind of escalating, pretty ramping it up there, Marine. That's great. Um, like the price is right. <laughs> yeah, really. You got to keep it going over. <laughs> That's exactly it. Is yeah. that how, I'm sure I haven't seen it for decades. I'm sure it's great. 
Right now, uh, registered in Alberta, about 30,000 nonprofits. It would be more than that active in here. It's hard to count. Data in the nonprofit sector is brutal to get. So uh, about 30,000 registered in Alberta, Societies Act, Companies Act, you know, various ag acts, that kind of thing, libraries perhaps. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big market. And there's ones that will be registered federally and then ones that register in other provinces that work here. You're probably in the 32, 33,000 nonprofits working in Alberta. And you might think to yourself, or if you don't, I think to myself, holy smokes, that's a lot of nonprofits. You know why that is? It's a lot of nonprofits. 30,000 is tough, right? Uh, again, data is tricky. I think we have more nonprofit, um, non nonprofits active in Alberta than probably anywhere else in North America, maybe the world per capita. And there's a lot of reasons. I'm always intrigued by why this is. I think Alberta has this sort of entrepreneurial spirit. It's really easy to start a nonprofit. And this is another sort of adage in nonprofits. Easy to, easy to start, hard to sustain. So every year in Alberta, probably about another 1,200 to 1,500 perhaps nonprofits register. So to register a nonprofit in the Society is pretty straightforward, not that hard. It takes you, you know, you probably have your thing up and running six weeks to a couple months perhaps. Um, but after about five years or so, 40 to 50% of those are no longer active, right? So we start a lot, but it's hard to keep them going, right? So that idea is that, you know, getting things up and off the ground you can do lots of great ideas, keeping them going is tougher. Where the industry part, I think, fits this really well is that it's the idea that, um, you know, you're not alone. Like you, we get people come to us all the time and say, we want to start a nonprofit. Great, fantastic idea. Tell us about your idea. One of the first ones say, you know, there's, there's probably three or four organizations doing this exact work. Have you thought about perhaps working with them? And whether you or not, we're kind of agnostic on that. Um, it's the idea that saying, have you thought about that? Do you know that what you're doing as a service probably isn't that unique? And a lot of times it comes back to saying, well, it's not ours. It's not our organization. And that's fair enough. I mean, these 30,000 we got running right now started because somebody took that step and they weren't all unique the whole time. So I mean, the first ones were because they had the advantage. So 30,000 um, nonprofits and charitable organizations, probably plus in that. You know, this is a big sector, $5 billion, lots of money. Doesn't necessarily get spread across the 30,000 really equally. A lot of it goes to the bigger players, less for the smaller players. Um, you know, about 5% of the workforce work in nonprofits, you know, that kind of thing. Lots of volunteer hours. This is an industry sector. So know that you're entering into a really established sector. There's lots of advantages. There's money, there's regulatory pieces, there's supports out there for you, but you're in a pretty competitive world, right? And that's the thing. No matter what you do and your strategy, we go back to that first quote is to give you that competitive advantage that separates you out from this world. And if you look down, when you think, okay, specifically to the industry side of things, this is how those 30,000 or so break out. Um, you have a lot in religion. Religion is the biggest number. Uh, sports and rec, those are the top two. The religion one is changing and condensing down. So as you move from sort of the Judeo-Christian models to much more face, you're seeing that whole bucket of nonprofit shift. We're also seeing, I think, the amalgamation or consolidation of small rural churches where you might have had, you know, thousands and thousands of small churches joining denominations, and that's the charitable entity. So a bit of a shift this way, um, and it goes down. So, But in each of these areas, wherever you are, there's lots of organizations. So be aware of who's out there, because if you're not, it can guarantee you funders are, or people who want to choose your services have other places to go. And part of your work is to say, well, this is why we are an alternative option, a complementary option, perhaps a better option, depending on how you want to phrase yourself. So lots of data on that. This is the open data source from the Alberta government. Uh, if you want to see a list of every nonprofit in Alberta is on the open data site, you can go through all 30,000. You can go get the charitable stuff from CRA. You can sort of see who's out there. And it's not, you know, if you want to go read that, it's not a great evening reading, but it does let you sort of see what other people are doing and who's out there in your space, perhaps. So sometimes an industry analysis is good. This is another tool. This one is uh, just a way of understanding your company. This is a business model, but certainly no reason why nonprofits can't do this. Understanding of its position relative to other companies. So some questions you might want to ask yourself. We're going to give you all these PowerPoint stuff later, so I don't have to write any of these down. This is recording too. You know, what are you really doing? Like, what are you doing? You know, what are your primary areas of activity? Does that actually, is that the same as other areas of work, uh, activity? And uh, you can define that broad or small if you're a choir, you know, is it the exact same type of choir? Is that going to attract a certain part? But who's out there? What are you doing? And what's different than them? What's the demand for your services? If you're in, in currently unexpected, if you are a um, senior serving organization, you know, demographically, that the senior market's going to explode in the next few, grow, not explode, and there's no that kind of stuff. But the idea that you're going to have way more seniors out there, 
less children, perhaps, depending on what happens on the immigration patterns here. So if you're building a seniors organization, you think, hey, buy some demand for our services. Who else is out there? Again, lots of folks out there who are similar, who's similar to you, who's maybe different. What are the barriers to entry in your, your industry? I mean, that's another good one. If it's really hard to start, if you've got something that's highly complex, lots of capital, perhaps, high skills, that's a barrier to entry. Maybe you have an advantage that way. What relationships are critical? Is it government? Is it funders? Are there nonprofits, advocates, those kind of things? Future opportunities, what's coming up the road again? And what is going to challenge this sector? We did some work with natural gas producers this fall or last year, I guess now. Um, and you know, one of the things they're dealing with is what happens when fossil fuels do start to decline. Natural gas, not so bad right now, but 10, 20 years out, does this, does this, you know, does this and this field, this industry exist? And they have to wrestle those kind of things. So not to be sort of locked into this thinking that the way things are today will be the way things are in two or three or five years. Sometimes change is fast, sometimes not quite so fast. All right, moving to the next one. If I can actually find my mouse here. Be aware of the external environment. This is probably my favorite part of this doing planning, is to just think about what happens beyond our organization, what's out there that um, we need to sort of think about. And this means sort of done really easily. We'll play with this a little bit here. I think we have time like this. Yeah, so this is a pest, um, another sort of standard tool in planning. There's a whole bunch of different versions of this kind of stuff. PEST just stands for political, economic, social, and technology. So what are the, the political, social, and economic, and technological factors that might impact your organization? These might be really near term. They might just be, you know, we've got um, changes on the political sphere in the next couple of years. Maybe it's the, a change in the federal government three years out or two years out, I guess now. You know, what's happening economically? We're in a bit of a boom now, but what might happen economically in the future here? Um, social trends, you're seeing this is one that's changed you know, dramatically in the last five years from the sort of the equity and diversity stuff to indigenous matters, black lives. You're now seeing globally things that are changing out there that affect what we do here. Technology, both in service demand, in social media, in the idea of how we consume and what we know about the world, whether it's true or not. Every time I see something coming up on my social media, I have to sort of think, I don't know if it's actually even true anymore. It may be interesting. And I used to say, hey, I saw something and I can't say that anymore because I don't know if it's true. So all these things affect us. And they may not affect us all equally. So what affects me as an organization, how I plan will be quite different than what affects you. But it's good to sort of think about these things. And why I like doing these exercises with boards and staff, it's kind of an even playing field. You're all speculating about the future. And so let's play with that a bit right now. So once we have these in place, so we kind of monitor and say, well, we got to sort of think, okay, if there is this change potentially coming, what do we do about such thing? So we're going to uh, put you in a really quick couple minute brainstorm session here. We have a thing called Jamboard. A Jamboard will pop into our link. It's in the chat, I believe, Liz. It'll mm -hmm. be, yep. Yep, it's there now. If you click on it, a little screen will pop up. Liz will walk you through it. And uh, we'll just play some ideas. What's going to happen in each of these areas, perhaps, that might affect how we do our work? Liz, how do we use such a thing? Interactive. All right. Jamboard it. interactive bit. It's quite simple. So if you want to put some text on a sticky note, just double click on one of these sticky notes, write a bunch of words, and you don't need to keep it uh, cryptically short. You can put in a sentence um, and then you'll press save. And then that text will be saved up there. And remember, it's PE. ST. So if you navigate up top here, you'll be able to see two other factors. And yeah, we encourage you to put um, something in every one of the categories if you like. So again, no right or wrong answer. It's all on and honest. Put what you want, you know, keep the swearing to minimum, minimum probably. That's a good idea. Um, but the idea that, uh, you know, what might be happening politically, economically, socially, click on the link, put some stuff in there. And uh, the nice thing for us is we can sort of monitor this from afar and sort of see what's popping up there. So which is nothing thus far, but I'm sure you're all still thinking of great answers or else Googling good answers. That's a better way to do it. So, And I think this is um, helpful to see, you know, we'll have a big brainstorm of all these ideas and I'll be exporting this and sharing this out there. And maybe there'll be factors that you didn't think about that you could bring, you know, to the table for your discussions. So... <laughs> <clears throat> Let's give you a minute to play with that. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't, then we shall move on. Uh, yeah. Great. Hybrid so, hybrid work practices. Fantastic. That's a great social. That's a great one, right? It, it, it's, it, that's a nice one because it fits really in that link between the operational side of nonprofits and what's sort of happening as a, a societal trend is, you know, where do people work? You know, one of the things that came out of COVID was we all went home and then we didn't come back. It's a picture of something in technology, and I don't know what that is. Hard to really riff on that one. Go back to the other screen. There, political part. Yeah. 
Yep. Economic factors. Exactly. Ongoing government austerity. Right. I mean, that's, I think we, the idea that governments, no matter how much they fund, there's always this idea it's not enough. And that's, that's kind of the, the world of nonprofits, you know, insatiable demand and limited and limited supply. And that's basic kind of theory. Um, stock exchange, financial crisis, changing governments, conservative. You're right. I mean, uh, it, it's palatable in Alberta, certainly. I'm assuming a lot of you are in Alberta, most of you in Alberta. The changes in, um, the, the 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 ideology the political style i'm not saying what's right or wrong but it certainly changes the world of nonprofits high inflation i think inflation is probably one of the bigger factors right now and it's such a it's such a challenging one because it's it's both really obvious and you you buy food or you you know whatever you're going to buy is more expensive but it's also insidious for nonprofits is that slow erosion bit by bit by bit largely born on the backs of staff if you're not paying big enough wage increases it also makes clients more needy you know, for some agencies. Um, you know, it uh, donations are affected by it. If you've got less disposable income, you're not donating as much. It, it, that's one of the bigger ones. Availability of funding, uh, local government elections. Yeah, and depending where you're at, sometimes the local government, how you're funded, really important, right? So all these things, we're going to sort of stop. You can, this is great. Now it's going. I don't want to keep going, but I got to keep moving because I'm out of time almost. Uh but play with this. Take this. This is a good one for a staff team and a board team. It's really good to sort of play with that. So, oh, thanks, John. I was scribbling in tech. Can't get this working. It was great. Your stuff was fantastic, John. Don't worry about it. We'll interpret it however we want. Um, so think about these things. Those are, again, a nice tool, easy tool to do. Why am I sharing me on the screen? Do you see me? Do you see the PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, I think you have to reshare your PowerPoint now. So I don't know. So we've done it. We've gone through who we are, how strong we are. We've gone through our industry. We kind of got a sense of what's out there, envisioning the future. We kind of got a sense of where everything is at in that A bucket. We want to now move toward B. We're going to go. Again, you know, not you can simply say, where do you want to be? I want to be twice the size. I want to be working in this area. I want to try a new program. Uh, a couple of thoughts on, on envisioning the future, though. Again, a bit of process is good. Um, you know, you must take into account the purpose of your organization. If you're a charity or a nonprofit, there's only certain things you can do. So especially in charities, a lot more restrictive that way. But to say, you know, we're doing work with um, persons with disabilities, but we really want to start doing some mental health stuff over here for other people. That's maybe fine, maybe strategic. If you can't, you got to then go adjust your purposes, which can be a bit of a challenge that way too as well. So to make sure the reality, the purposes, and the reality of the world. Again, I want to triple the size of my organization. Fantastic. Great dream, Mike. Is that real? Is that realistic? Probably not in a lot of cases. We sometimes get people really think they can grow a lot. Growth is tough, right? So how do you make sure that you're not sort of just way out there where it's not rooted in reality? Yeah, we can imagine a lot of plausible futures, but it's got to be something, again, plausible. Got to be something we can imagine, something that's a bit different than we are today. It's hard, though, because you're making decisions today that are really going to set you on that course. It's not just dreaming of the future. We're going to try and take some steps that kind of lock us into that. We don't have all the information we need. We're not, we're not you know, clairvoyant that way. So how do we pick these things? Another slide, Liz. Um, you know, a lot of times, and especially for nonprofits, the, the, the future isn't always disconnected from the past. And in a lot of cases, it's really an evolutionary thing. And a lot of times when we write strategy, it is the idea that, um, you know, it's got to be something new. It's got to be create all these different um, pieces for us that we didn't have in place before. Well, that's not necessarily true. The things you're doing should be a part of your strategy. And in most cases, uh, really quite really well rooted in the things you're doing today. Because you built those intentionally, you've done them well. So why why do you need to change that? Doesn't mean you always stay that way, but you make sure you're sort of honoring and being aware of the things you've already done that are really well. And again, that that rooted in reality is nonprofits tend to have some really guiding forces and strategy. The things you already do well that you're doing, you built your organization around, and what you expect money to be in the next few years. Those are two pretty good guide rails to sort of drive you down what the strategic path might look like. But you can use some sort of prompts to sort of start you thinking about where the future is. You know, what should we start doing? What are the things that are new on the table we haven't tried before? What should we stop doing? And that's an important thing. That's the saying no component sometimes. And then maybe it's the stuff you've done in the past or stop taking on new projects as they come up. But what are the things that are holding you back? And then what do you continue on those kind of things? And maybe a big, hairy, audacious goal, we're going to put a stake in the ground. And, you know, in Calgary, you know, 15 years ago, ago, they put in the stake in the ground of the 10-year plan to end homelessness put a big clock on their website and said, counting different 10 years will end homelessness. But a year and a half before that 10 years ran out, they pulled the clock off the website because homelessness wasn't going down. doesn't mean they didn't do good, good work, but it was a big goal. And it rallied some things and really changed the way we do collective work in the 10-year plan. 
But, you know, it's the idea, it's not always achievable as one of those goals. And that can be okay, but you can't oversell it, nor do you want to undersell it. You can do a sustainability analysis. That's a tool to sort of think about what parts of your model you want to keep and let go of, what really add value to the mission piece. We can put a link to that in some of our packages too, to sort of think, okay, do we need to sort of think through our program mix? Again, be inclusive, involved for the whom this matters. You're trying to create a future without involving people you're going to serve. That can be a bit disconnected. And maybe it's for the board, staff, other proxies, but don't just sort of do things that are really away from the communities you want. And then refine it. You're never going to get it right the first time. Just sort of think about that, where you're going, get it till it feels right, that it feels clean. And you can probably say it in a few lines, this is where we're heading. It's got to be clear. It's got to be compelling. It's got to be both aspirational and inspirational to get you there. So just some thoughts on creating that goal. Um, doesn't have to be huge, but can be huge. It's sort of got a whole range of kind of stuff here. And the plan itself. Um, this is kind of how do you break it down? So you've got A, we know we're here. We've got a, a pretty well articulated aspirational, inspirational vision of where we're going. How do we put the pieces in place? And I think this is akin to climbing a mountain. So if you look at how you climb a mountain, there's lots of little steps up the way. You've kind of got the strategies that big, those are kind of the big, broad things. We're going to go up to the top. Again, in nonprofits, they tend to fall into buckets, I believe, people, money, profile, programs, and your organizational infrastructure. So we know we need to work in these each areas. And then we break those down into longer term goals and shorter term goals. So from moving, so we're not shooting for the top right now, that overall big audacious goal, perhaps, we've got some chunks along the way. We're going to go to base camp to base camp. We've broken it down into one, you know, sometimes by time, sometimes by function and then steps along the way. So if I say I'm gonna diversify my funding, I'm gonna be financially sustainable is my overall goal. To do that, I'm gonna diversify my funding. Then I've really broken it down and say, okay, I'm going to add 20% of earned revenue to my mix. I'm gonna increase my private donations by 5% over the next two years. I'm going to get more government funding from this source. So as you get farther down, it gets far more detailed, far more precise, far more measurable. And this is a good tool or a good thought process to get, keep us in that mode of not just sort of putting these grand visions out there that are not rooted in reality, or we don't have any steps along the way. So a good way of doing this, oh, actually, I'll give you a piece at the end here to sort of get this front and center for you too. So yeah, from those big, big top goals, medium goals, shorter term goals, they get more precise, more quantifiable, more measurable as you move down the list. You can adjust. Sometimes you're climbing that mountain, you think, ah, geez, something happened here. I got to shift this one over. So your big strategy, where you're heading, you can try and keep that the same. But those medium and shorter term ones, they can adjust quite a bit, especially the shorter term ones. You know, I try to adjust my funding by 10% and that one got shut down. I got to adjust a couple more of those because it didn't quite work that way. So the big ones kind of stay a little more set. As you move down, you got lots of room to move to adjust. That's why you're evaluating, saying we tried something. Everything you write in the strap plan is not going to come true. I look at my strap plan and go, ooh, we can do that one. But it's not a mistake. It's something that was our best intent. We tried it. We had to adjust. No shame in that at all. So this is an example, perhaps, of a, a larger strategic goal and some actions we put along the way. This is one about diversity of funding as well. So this is one we pulled from one of our plans. We stripped the, the identifiers out of it. You know, they're going to diversify funding to improve sustainability and increase discretionary funds. So both what we're going to do and a bit of the why in that overall statement and then to do that, they had a social enterprise, they had a commercial kitchen they could use, um, long-term funding strategy with fund development, and then uh, increasing the culture of philanthropy. So in some action steps, and the way when they went into each of those sort of three bottom bullets, they actually broke down into one, two, and three-year goals for each of those areas. So some things you can think about that way. Liz? Putting it in action. So this is, again, the idea these don't shit on shelves. They sit on shelves. They... Uh, they, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, they, they, uh, um, they should be something that's living. And this is a great tool from Bridgespan. Bridgespan is a great capacity to the states. Lots of free resources. Again, on the conceptual stuff, great. Regulatory stuff, try and find made in Alberta, made in Canada stuff. We're quite a bit different kind of model up here. But this one works really well for you. And this, what I like about this one is it's really broken down into worksheets and tools free again. So at the end of the process, you, um, yep, keep going. What's the other one? Yep. The, uh, this quote's great. We've often heard a collective sigh of relief when the planning process is over. You come through this long battle and it's not, we we're, we're just want to be finished and have it over. <clears throat> but you're not because it's, you, you're, you're still got lots to do. So again, this should be an, an energizing coalescing process. So what this does, this tool, 
it allows you to take it and keep it interactive with you. So just the next slide or two, Liz, and we'll walk through this last little bit here, uh, if I make it that long. And so how do you sort of take it step by step from taking those big goals to the sort of blue blueprints to mobilizing your team, getting your financial stuff, monitoring progress, and then how you revisit and evaluate. So it takes you through templates. In the next couple, next slide here, I'll show you a few templates. It walks you through each of the pieces. They're a little blurry there. Maybe I'm just crying because I'm coughing. But it walks you through a planning template. You don't need to create all this stuff. It'll take your strategy and say, we want to diversify our funding. Okay, who's going to do it? Buy one. What are the steps? What's going to cost us to do these things? What are the interdependencies? A lot of times you write people writing strategies saying, you got people saying, we're going to do this with people. And something over here with finance as well. If you're going to hire more people, might need some more money. Probably need to integrate those things. That coordinated action step, right? So this is a nice toolkit. It's in the, it's, it'll be in the slides. It'll be in the, the resources afterwards. But it breaks it down into a whole bunch of sheets. You don't have to recreate all this stuff yourself. So that idea of keeping it front and center, keeping it concrete, keeping it usable, and allow you to adjust as you move forward. Excellent. There we go. I'm back. Um, <clears throat> How do you keep it forward? Just some base thoughts on how do you keep this front and center? How do you make sure you're not just putting it on the shelf? You know, you, you, you keep just like day to day activities and emerging problems, they can take you away from this stuff. You know, I got a strategy and something sort of veered me this way. Fair enough, that happens. You can't do anything about that. But how do you return to it? And if you need to return to it to keep back on correct course, great. If you need to adjust where you're going, fair enough. But if you embed these things in your part of your staffing processes, I embed mine in my script, my board report saying, this is how we're moving forward. When we talk about how to work with staff, they are in these lines. So the idea that keep it there as something is not just in the background, but you use in it or whatever way you can. And then it takes some discipline to do that um, because I think we do get sort of caught up in today and what we're doing on a project by project or day by day or minute by minute basis. So how do you not be always coming back to it where people are sick and tired of hearing about this stupid strap plan, Mike, I'm tired of hearing about it, but how do you make it relevant and inspiring to them? So that idea um, will help you with that bridge stand stuff, will help you with that kind of stuff too. And as we move to the end, a couple of questions to get, who leads, who should be involved in this process? You know, I think for organizations to have board and staff is a very much a shared process. Uh, I think those are the best ones. I, I think you don't have to have people involved all the way through it, but I think I like starting larger and then narrowing it down to a bit of a working group. Again, more voices, better ideas. If you only have boards doing this, you're quite disconnected from the actual reality of the day-to-day -day operations. If you only have staff doing it, perhaps sometimes you're, you lost that sort of outside perspective and that longer term oversight role that boards play. So I think that mix is in there. Um, so I, I would say probably the blend is the best, um, but whatever fits for you. How long does it take and how big should the plan be? You know, it's it's a bit of an art to these things. We do probably a half dozen strap plans on the go right now with organizations. You kind of want to keep some momentum going because sometimes they grind and they stall and that happens. Life gets busy for everybody. But if you sort of go, you know, weeks or months between sessions of planning, you've lost everything, you're kind of starting again. So it's a bit of that enough time to let things sort of percolate and grow inside your head between meetings without losing momentum. So I think three months is a pretty good sweet spot if you can keep it going, but you gotta sort of take in consideration summers, holidays, blizzards, pandemics, vacations. Oh, there's a lot of stuff in there. So but how do you keep it going? Just keep some momentum, but don't go too fast. I mean, I can write a strap plan in an hour. It would be very good, it would be very inclusive. So it does take time to do these things. How big should it be? Remember, we look at every strap plan when we work with organizations, you get a 40, 50 page strap plan. You know who's read that? No one. I mean, it's like, well, probably somebody who wrote it, read it. I'm sure somebody read those things. I didn't read it. But it's the idea that if it's 40 or 50 pages, it's probably not really strategic. I think getting it down to, there's still some background stuff. There's lots of stuff that beat into these things, the assessment stuff, the analysis pieces. Fair enough. But your strap, I think we're writing five-page strap plans right now. Some context, some background work, the strategies, and then the so what. Whatever works for you, but make them usable, make them relevant, make them aspirational and inspirational. And do you need outside help? Of course you. No one can write one without us. So I don't know why you even think about that. No, you, you may or may not. Um, I think outside help is good. Even for our own plan, we, you bring in somebody for us sometimes to do that. It is the objective voice that does not have a stake in the game and uh, can challenge you, can keep you on track, can moderate voices. Sometimes you get really strong voices. People around for a while, people are just loud. And to say, we're going this way. 
I think having some outside facilitation at least helps that. But again, whatever works for you, whatever process or tool, it's got to fit you. But the that process guidance can be an important part to it. That's about it. Oh, over time. Holy smokes, I'm never over time. It's the cough. I wish I had time for questions, but I don't. Liz, what do we do? <laughs> no? Okay. We only have one question. Do you want to get to it? I do. Yeah, sure. Well, okay. it's, <laughs> um, it's a it's a one question. Um, what are your thoughts on the difference of impact between a rolling strat plan that's refreshed every year versus refreshing one every three years and not touching it in between? I think it's a very interesting question. Yeah, it's, interesting. it's an interesting one. I wish I had more time on this one. But the idea that sometimes the rolling one's great, but you do get a bit of blow back and forth by the wind. So it's really, what's the North Star? I think there, in either of those methods, there's got to be a North Star. And the strategy to get there may shift, but it's the idea that it's not just sort of being blown about by the winds when the winds change. And so I like probably rolling once. It's sort of one year. I like to say, where are we going next year? Because I think it, it, if you do it really tight and quick, and it can be quite energetic and sort of saying that, but it's the what's the making sure I'm not just sort of taking a rolling, iteratively rolling approach to getting way off track. And that's what I worry about that. That's all. So it's an excellent question, though. Wish we could cool. talk more. Too. All right. Yeah. Um, and there's this quote, um, but I think I'll move on to the other stuff. Um, thank you all for uh, hanging out with us today. We do have a session survey that I just dropped into the chat there. And I do look at every single one. Um, and so if you have any topics, as we said, we're here to help you folks. So um, any topics that serve your learning needs best, um, I do read them. And we have created new workshops out of these surveys. So um, please do visit that. Uh, we do have a couple workshops you might be interested in. Um, you can read more about these on our website or register the same way that you registered for this session. But in a week, we have a brand new session on collaborative communication. Uh, and this is an in-depth two and a half hour workshop that's really perfect for board teams. And that's to up their skills, running effective meetings, exploring communication styles, managing different uh, difficult conversations. Um, and it's a small group session. So expect lots of um, interactive bits and skill building activities. Um, and then to wrap up the year, we have another new workshop. It's all about the different ways in, in which nonprofit organizations can collaborate. So if this session today got you thinking strategically, um, we have Leslie Tamagi and we have Mike here that will break down mergers, amalgamations, joint programming, and they'll use real life strategic alliances from Alberta's nonprofit sector as sort of case studies. And there'll be activities and tools to help guide any decisions um, towards partnership or collaboration, I think. It's a really, really cool session. Um, and that's all we have for today. And if you do want any more support uh, for your organization um, from one nonprofit to another, you can check out our website. Um, otherwise, you can expect an email from me later today and keep checking back onto our website package um, where you'll find all the recordings and the slides and other resources that are just easy to look at, visit, and share. So thank you, everyone, for visiting us today. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Take care. Always a privilege to be with you. Bye-bye.